Well, suffice it to say, Lance Lynn was not fooling anybody. What's going on, everyone, and welcome into this edition of B-Shafe Daily. Brendan Schaefer here with you Sunday morning, July 7th, 2024, breaking down a Cardinals loss. Washington Commanders 14, St. Louis Battlehawks 6, as Lance Lynn was absolutely blitzed by the Nationals lineup on Saturday afternoon. We'll talk about exactly why that came to be and where the Cardinals go from here. And this will be the part where we do have to start considering how do the Cardinals handle the upcoming trade deadline? Will starting pitcher be something on their radar after an outing like this for Lance Lynn? I know a lot of Cardinals fans want to hear conversation about potential trade targets. Is it a little bit easier said than done, though, for the Cardinals? And is that something that they would be willing to pursue even though they do kind of have five guys right now penciled into their rotation. What happens if one of them isn't performing well? Is that going to be something that could inspire change for the Cardinals? A lot to get into and not a lot of time today as the Cardinals have a quick turnaround at 12.35 p.m. Central Time on Sunday. But I wanted to get a quick video out. I know there won't be a ton to break down from last night's game, given the score and the fact that it was basically over before it started. But as always, we have a lot to get into. So if you want daily Cardinals coverage throughout the season and the offseason, we're here year-round, hit that subscribe button on the YouTube channel or go follow the B-Shafe Daily Podcast on Spotify. Link for channel memberships as well is on YouTube right there in the video description. Appreciate the support we've gotten from so many listeners. Ken R. signing up as a channel member within the last couple of days. And Jen, my friend Jen, she upgraded her support on the channel to a new level. Hunter figured out the issue with his debit card, and he's back in there as a subscriber. I think we're up to at least 25 channel members at this point. So appreciate you guys who have hopped on board and are helping make this channel what it is and allowing me to do the work that I'm doing covering the Cardinals for y'all this season. Okay, let's talk Lance Lynn. It wasn't good. They bombarded him, the Washington Nationals, from the very first pitch, C.J. Abrams, who is on a couple of my fantasy teams. He's having a really nice year. But the problem for Lance Lynn was what typically goes well for him is establishing the count early. Those first pitch strikes are typically where he's able to do his damage. And I think he had 16 of them in his last outing. This time, it's as though the Nationals were ready for it and said, look, all Lance Lynn's going to try to do to us is throw us those first pitch fastballs. And when he does, be ready for him. Don't let him get into those advantageous pitchers counts where then we have to wonder, uh uh-oh, is it going to be the four-seamer or is it going to be the sinker or is it going to be a two-cutter? What's he going to throw? It's usually going to be a fastball. It's always going to be the answer. But once you get into those pitchers counts and two-strike situations, Lynn is able to expand a little bit on the zone and throw pitches that are going to tail just out of the strike zone. And that could be maddening for hitters. But early in counts, I guess they read the scouting report. Lance Lynn wants to pound strikes, and he did, to his credit, but not the kind of strikes that were going to be very effective for the Cardinals in this game. As Abrams took him deep on the first pitch, and then Cabert Ruiz got him as well for a three-run homer, and the route was pretty much on from there. The Nationals score an almost unfathomable 11 runs against Lance Lynn, 10 of them earned in two and two-thirds innings. He allowed nine hits allowed three home runs. He walked four. Like when you're combining the fact that your first pitch strikes are as juicy as they were for Nationals batters, and you consider that you walked four, you're not really doing much right at all. Uh, Ali Marmel at a certain point just has to try to allow Lance Lynn to throw his pitch count and get through it a little bit to save the bullpen as much as possible. And Lance Lynn wasn't even really able to do that. And as I'm going here, it occurs to me to excuse myself again for the audio quality. Uh, We'll be back home on Monday, and so the podcast we do on Sunday afternoon's game, even Sunday night, will be back to the better quality. But the quality of Lance Lynn's pitching was not very high. 82 pitches, like I said, try to get him a little deeper into the game simply because you're down 9-0 after two. And then when the Cardinals score four runs in the third, you know, the Cardinals just came back from a five-run deficit the previous day, so you know it's possible. But if you're Ollie Marmel, you still have to try to run Lance Lynn out and see if you can't get four or five innings out of him, and that didn't go very well. Two and two-thirds, 11 runs. There's just no circumstance in which the team is going to come back and win a game after that kind of pitching performance. 
Lance Lynn's ERA balloons to 4.48 for the season. And when you consider that there had been a number of games where unearned runs have tagged Lance Lynn in shortened starts as well, that kind of paints a picture that it just hasn't really been a great season for him. Again, you're going to be able to play the game of, well, if you take out that one terrible start, the numbers look a lot better. But this was, I mean, this was 2023 Lance Lynn rearing his ugly head. He's a guy that led the league in the number of home runs he allowed last year. And you kind of saw why yesterday with the way that he performed. He's allowed now 13 homers on the season, still a much better pace than the 44 he gave up between his stint with the White Sox and the Dodgers in 2023. But as far as slotting Lance Lynn into his spot in the Cardinal rotation, how do folks feel about him right now? Let me know in the comments. Try to keep it clean. Uh, remember, this guy still is a Cardinal, so you want to be nice. But I, I I can't put him any higher than as a number five right now, I think, with what, what happened yesterday. And look, try to have a short memory and understand that Lance Lynn has had some pretty good games recently. It looked like he was starting to come out of the doldrums a little bit between his start against Atlanta and then Cincinnati, but goes back out on the road where he has been a lot more problematic. In, in recent times, and it was a tough one against Washington, and even prior to that that couple of start stint against Cincy and Atlanta at home, where he pitched six innings, no runs, six and two thirds, one run. Uh, he had that really rough one in Miami. So it's kind of been the, the the road woes for Lance Lynn to the extent that you wonder if you did get into a longer playoff series. And I know right now people say, did you not see yesterday's game? He gave up eleven runs. Why are we talking about? Lance Lynn potentially pitching in a playoff series. But look, right now it's a certain way. Three months from now, we don't really know what it's going to feel like with this Cardinal rotation because Miles Michaelis has had a similar year. He's had stretches of being really effective. He's had stretches where you don't want to see him anywhere near a mound in a Cardinal uniform. Uh, uh, you know, Kyle Gibson has mostly been pretty good, but has had some bad starts. Uh, Sonny is going to be your number one, I think, regardless. And then you've got Andre Pallante kicking around there and doing a pretty nice job. Uh, you're not just going to suddenly say, oh, he's your number two or your number three based on uh, a short stretch. At least I don't think so. But maybe you have more confidence in seeing what Palante has done recently. I just think it, the reality is the Cardinals have a bunch of guys in their rotation outside of maybe Sonny and maybe give a nod to Kyle Gibson, although he's kind of trending in the other direction, too, that are really number fours and their cosplaying is number twos and threes at certain times because you have a rotation of of a of a one. I'll still consider Sonny Gray to be a one. He's not one of the top ones in the league the way that he's performed, but is he a top 30 pitcher in baseball? I think so. I think if you were going to do a, a fantasy draft for the 2024 season, I'm not talking fantasy baseball, but like just a total redraft of MLB for one year, I think Sonny would be one of the first 30 starting pitchers uh, that is currently healthy that would be taken. That being said, behind him, you don't really have a bona fide number two. You don't really have a bona fide number three. Uh, you've got guys that at times can look like twos. Lynn has had his moments of doing it. Gibby has certainly had his moments. Even Miles Michael is at, at times, maybe not as frequently this year, has done so. But when they when they combine in the other types of performances, you get to thinking, yeah, this guy's more of a three, maybe a four. And you get into that conversation about postseason. It's where the Cardinals, I really do think, would benefit from still being aggressive searching for potential opportunities as far as trades go when it comes to starting pitching. Uh, I Ultimately, I do think that this is going to be a topic of conversation all month long on B-Shave Daily. So again, subscribe if you enjoy that kind of conversation. It's only just sort of beginning. So this is not going to be an episode specifically about trade targets. But if you have a name in mind or two that you think should be under consideration, uh, let me know in the comments because that's sort of going to be what we're angling to discuss outside of just the day-to-day -day conversations about the games uh, as we move forward. I saw an article recently talking about Tampa Bay Rays' Zach Eflin being a possible trade target for the Cardinals at the deadline. And I think pointing out that name is sort of a way to highlight exactly how difficult it could end up being for the Cardinals to have a tangible upgrade. I'm just looking at Eflin's numbers this year. He's got a 4.19 ERA. I think he's got next year at $18 million. So maybe that's something where the, the Rays would eat some money if they were to trade Zach Eflin, which is always an, a nice possibility. But I look at Eflin's recent numbers, you know, five innings, five runs, six innings, zero runs, had a good start there, seven innings, four runs, five and two-thirds, three earned runs, 
five and two thirds, two on runs. That's the last five for Eflin. And it kind of amounts to a 4.19 ERA, which is exactly what he is. And that's what the Cardinals kind of already have, right? So it's a little bit tricky to say, hey, they're going to go out and get a tangible upgrade at the starting rotation spot. And then who do you kick out of the rotation? Well, you probably want to kick out of the rotation whoever had just been bad over the past week. And in this instance, it's going to be Lance Lynn. Uh, a week ago, it's Miles Michaelis. It's, it's going to be tough, I think, for the Cardinals to find obvious upgrades over the guys that they have but the guys that they have clearly are not good enough i think when you get into a playoff rotation situation to feel like you're going to be able to outlast somebody else in a five game series or even a three game series a best two out of three how do the cardinals line up their pitching to gain confidence in that they're just going to have to probably get lucky that it's going to be a week where you get good lance lynn instead of bad lance lynn or you get good miles michaelis instead of bad you get good gibby instead of bad gibby you know, good Sonny instead of bad Sonny. Sonny is not impervious to any of this conversation. Let's not pretend he's, you know, he's had his his struggles as well. And, and as recently as this weekend. So I think this ends up being a very compelling conversation, but also maybe a difficult one. And then you ask, OK, who are you willing as a Cardinals fan to see go if they're really going to make a, a big upgrade? Like, does Max Scherzer get healthy and become available from the Rangers? And maybe they'll even eat some money. Who are you trading to get that done? Because when you think about the Cardinals in their system, I think today, J- July 7th, they are a little bit more well positioned than they were three months ago to make a trade like this. Because I think if you look at the guys rising in their system, Quinn Matthews at the double A level has has really impressed it with his quick rise through the system uh, was was out of Stanford last summer. Uh, Cooper Jerpy, when when healthy, has looked really good. And the Cardinals have been very careful to manage his innings and his pitch counts, but he's looked really effective, had like a 10 inning hitless streak recently. Um, I, I, I'm trying to remember, Graceffo started yesterday and I got a comment on YouTube. We were talking down on the farm. I got a comment on YouTube about Graceffo. It was a rain delay that caused him to go only a couple of innings, I believe. So uh, just a, a quick addendum to a previous podcast. Thank you to the commenter who mentioned that that's why he was was scratched early. But like Graceffo has flashed in the big leagues to where, uh, not saying he's the same as Sandy Alcantara, but remember the Cardinals had Alcantara. He got a little bit of exposure at the big league level uh, as a reliever. And then the Cardinals eventually traded him in that off season. And the Marlins said, hey, look, we've seen this guy's stuff play a little bit at the big league level. Maybe he's somebody that could fit. Uh, not saying Graceffo is the same thing, but I think it's a little bit more that Graceffo could be a tangible trade target for somebody because they can at least say, hey, he pitched a day at the big leagues threw 67 pitches and didn't get blown up, you know, four and a third innings, one run. It's better than the alternative, right? To come out with your debut and give up 10 runs. That's happened before too. So I'm not saying that Graceffo is suddenly a huge name for trades, but, and I'm not saying the Cardinals want to trade some of these guys that we're talking about. Jerpy, uh, Quinn Matthews, uh, Tink Hens obviously is kind of still working through some, some injury stuff, but uh, he's another guy that has, has a lot of pedigree in terms of, Hey, if you're really talking about making a big swing, that's another guy that you could potentially, as long as the health thing tracks, he's somebody that I think teams are going to be interested in. So the Cardinals have some interesting names, some of them into the top 100 prospects, some of them not. Would they be willing to make a move for the now if it trades away a guy that could be tomorrow or the next day's answer in the rotation? By the next day, I mean like 2026. You might be waiting a couple of years for some of these guys that are at double A now. It's hard to put a timeline and say, no, they've got to be ready by 2025. Some of them will. Like, in my opinion, a Quinn Matthews, I think, is either going to be there or he's not going to be. And I think by 2025, at some point that summer, we're going to know that because he's 23, 24 years old. He was a, a multi-year college pitcher, has risen really quickly, has has thrown a lot of innings at the collegiate level anyway. So his arm is kind of built up to do this. And uh, we'll talk down on the farm. He pitched actually yesterday uh, for the uh, AA Springfield Cardinals, and we'll talk about his outing. I think some of these guys are going to be ready sooner than later, but they're not going to be ready now. And if you have a chance, if a name comes on the market that you're like, you know what, that's a difference maker for 2024. And and maybe he's under team control with a contract for 2025. Those are the types of names that the Cardinals are going to have to think long and hard about. Do they consider trading a position player that previously would have been considered untouchable? I don't think it's crazy to talk about Jordan Walker when He's still sitting there at AAA, and the Cardinals have not shown any instant procl- uh, proclivity, excuse me, to call him up. So there's there's going to be teams, I think, that'll go, hey, what's the deal? What's Jordan Walker's deal? 
and they might ask about him. What do the Cardinals do when that happens? I'm not, I'm going to try to stay neutral in this. I'm not going to try to give you they need to or they should because we're not going to know all the, the ins and outs of what some of these trade talks are going to entail, at least until some further reporting and some scuttlebutt comes about. And even then, remember, the scuttlebutt is strategic in the way that it gets leaked as well. So don't always just take it as gospel. It's going to be interesting. It's going to be a very interesting period of a few weeks for the Cardinals to sort of determine what's the route that they want to go, what teams decide, hey, we're not buyers, we're actually sellers, and we've got a piece that we could unload, and we're looking to improve for the future. Maybe that changes everything. A team that you don't expect to go on a five-game losing skid does so, and they're knocked out of the wild card race as they see it, and from there the Cardinals are able to just kind of swoop in. Like These are things that could happen. Who are you willing to deal? Are you willing to deal from the major league roster to, to do a shakeup? Does Dylan Carlson fit in any of these talks? Nolan Gorman, he's leading your team in homers, but do you decide there's a cap on his production and does another team see more from him and and say even despite some of the, the, the low times this year, they really like the high times and they're willing to pay through the nose for it for left-handed power uh, that can play a, a few different positions. This is going to be a very interesting time. We'll see what the Cardinals do. Let me know in the comments what you think they should do. And look, there are going to be some Cardinals fans who say, hey, sell Goldie and Arenado. Look, it's a very unique circumstance that the Cardinals veterans and highest paid players are some of the worst players in their lineup right now with the way they're performing on a daily basis. Goldie should not be batting cleanup anymore, right? But until you get some guys back, like Lars Nupar, I think they they said his rehab is done, so he's going to be ready to rejoin the team any day now. Until you get some more of these guys back and then some others at the bottom of the order producing better, like a Gorman, like a Walker coming back up, it's hard to really say you can move Goldie all the way down to number seven. You know, it's just there's not a lot of guys at the bottom of the order consistently producing. So we've had that lineup conversation day in and day out. It's where the Cardinals are at. But you're also not going to look at, well, trade him, trade Goldschmidt. What do you get? I mean, you're getting nothing for him. He's still tangible in that he's a veteran in the clubhouse that I think is is one of these team team leaders. And that stuff does matter to an extent. So as much as you do need his production on the field to improve, there are other considerations that I think the Cardinals are going to keep in mind before they start getting crazy with it. Remember, the, the, the one time that they've really done something of the sort, which is to trade a veteran from the team, somebody that ostensibly would be helping them win games, but because they're underperforming, they're not getting that kind of bang for their buck. 2011, Colby Rasmus. And that was a different circumstance. He didn't have a big contract. He was someone that you thought was for the present and the future. And John Mozeliak said, no, we're going to make this move because we can fill some needs. They won the World Series. I, I don't think this is the same instance. Uh, Alan Craig, I've, I've alluded to as well, a couple of years later with the John Lackey trade. He was somebody that was under contract but was not performing, and so they moved him. Goldie has a little bit of a different cachet to him. And I just don't see the Cardinals making that move. Do I see them bidding him adieu and saying, we appreciate your service after the year if his numbers don't improve on an expiring contract? Absolutely. I could certainly see that. And then we're talking about, is Alec Burleson your first baseman next year? Uh, You know, does Brendan Donovan play some first? Does does Wilson take up some first? Devon Herrera to get his bat in the lineup, does he take up some first? Like, there's a whole new conversation to be had. What does it mean for Arenado if Goldie, you know, walks? Does Arenado... Uh, you know, want to want to go to, you know, there's going to be a lot in the off season that has to kind of get unpacked. But for right now, I just think they're going to have to ride guys like Goldie through some of this and we'll see whether it ends up being the right thing or not. It would be a very interesting conversation if Goldie's production continues to really suffer and you get into August, September, does he become more of a part-time player? And do they start to usher in some other ways to, ramp up the lineup. Like there are a lot of things that are going to be considered. So I've given you just kind of an overall view as I see it, the helicopter 10,000 foot view here. Let me know though, there's stuff I haven't talked about, stuff I've missed. Certainly going to be an interesting few months in terms of the Cardinals, not few months, few weeks. It's it's coming sooner than you think, end of July for the trade deadline to get here. Um, Starting rotation, I think is an area that you still have to consider is my bottom line. I know that you've got five healthy right now, but it, there's going to be a point where you're five, six games above 500. You're into August, September, and you say, hey, that guy we traded for, as much as Lance Lynn's, you know, we love Lance Lynn. He's under a one-year contract. He doesn't have to be here next year, and he can be a long reliever if it's necessary. Um, maybe Lance Lynn turns it around, and you're having a similar conversation about Miles Michaelis. And you say, look, I know he's under contract for next year, but we've, we'll figure that out when we get there. It, it should be performance-based down the stretch, and there should not really be any veteran 
they, look, they got a rotation full of veterans. We know that. But I don't think any of them should necessarily get, uh, you know, special treatment above a Palante if Palante is the one performing. They need the best five to go through August and to go through September. So we'll see. I, it, it could mean some tough decisions that we don't know if the Cardinals historically have been willing to make. Could they decide that this is the the year where they do need to be a little bit more aggressive in making those decisions because they can't afford to let a chance at the playoffs slip away if the writing is on the wall for one or two of these starting pitchers that maybe they need to go in a different direction. Mentioned that Lance Lynn had worse numbers on the road, was able to look those up as I was talking here. He's got a 5.36 ERA on the road and a 3.66 at home. So I do think that is a drastic enough split that you might try to to manage and, and massage the rotation in spots to get Lynn pitching at Bush more often than not. That could be something that benefits the team. And is there any rhyme or reason to it? Maybe, maybe not. It's definitely a more home run friendly park. And if you look at the numbers for Lynn, uh, that tracks. He's given up nine home runs on the road. He's given up only four home runs at home and has had nine starts in each location. So Bush, um, the idea that Bush has been more friendly to him has certainly been the case, but he's also allowed a lower batting average at home, 215 opposing batting average, 297 when you flip it to away games. So that's where Lance Lynn's at. It's where the Cardinals are at. Um, let me know where you're at on this rotation, on this pitching staff, and on what they need to be doing at the upcoming trade deadline. Mentioned the bullpen here real quick. Matthew Libertor uh, gave up a couple of runs, but just had to sort of eat it in two and a third innings. And then credit to Gallegos, man. He threw three innings. It was very much garbage time, so kind of like that Graceffo outing from a week ago or so. Uh, but he threw three innings, and right now that's where Gio's got to be. He's not a leveraged guy for this team until he shows otherwise. And three innings, one run, you'll take that as a way to save the rest of the bullpen and the guys that you really do want to be rested and available for those leverage situations. Offensively, not a whole lot to say about the game just because it was such a bad one, but the Cardinals did end up putting together some hits against uh, Mackenzie Gore. Get, get scored five runs against him in three innings and uh, did some nice things. 11 hits for the team. Gorman was three for five, so he's definitely tracking toward what we had talked about, maybe a move back up in the lineup. Arenado continuing to do some good things. He's got the OPS at 700 after a two for four. Also, uh, respace via walk. Goldie was over, but did reach via walk. Mason Wynn, uh, man, all star could be calling his name. Two for four, two runs scored, had an RBI and a walk as well. So he was on base three times with the average pushing 300 and the uh, 761 OPS has been very good. Good to see a nice day from Donovan, two for five, and Michael Ciani at the bottom of the lineup had a hit and a run scored as well as a run driven in. It just kind of, it just didn't really seem to matter all that much. Wilson was on base three times. Like I could go through the lineup. It just didn't matter that much because they were down nine, nothing after two. And you don't tend to win many of those games. So we'll see Sunday if the Cardinals are able to kind of battle back and have a little bit of a better showing uh, a start that keeps them in the game from Kyle Gibson. That would be what you prefer. He's got a 3.880 RA on the season. And he'll be looking for some success in just a couple hours from now as I record this. I know this won't be uh, a, a very timely podcast, but better to do it than not to do it. Uh, let's real quickly go down on the farm so I can tell you about the nice start from Quinn Matthews from yesterday. Man. It's time to go down on the farm. Man. So I won't spend too much time on it because I know I've got to get this episode out and ready to go before uh, before the game starts on Sunday. But Double A Cardinals, Springfield Cardinals had a nice day. It's a six to three win over the Naturals. They've done a nice job this week, winning some ball games. Uh, Lars Newbart didn't do a ton at the plate, but he just walked every time he came up. O for one with three walks. Uh, did strike out once, but he was on base three times. And they said that's going to be it for his rehab. So whether he rejoins the Cardinals in D.C., they still play there on Monday, or if he waits until the return back home, uh, we'll see what ends up happening there. But Quinn Matthews, the starter that we alluded to earlier in the show, five and a third innings allowed three runs. That's called holding your own at the double-A level. He also had seven strikeouts, which is good to see that his stuff is still playing pretty well at double-A as he has risen through the system very rapidly this season. I was kind of surprised to see him at low-A to begin the year, uh, but goes up to, to, to high-A and now to double-A. Has a two-and-a-half ERA there, so good to see that. And the Memphis Redbirds, quick talk about triple-A. They lose four to one. Uh, decent enough pitching performance by the team. Uh, Connor Thomas got the start. They just kind of go with a, a bullpen game a lot of the times when he's out there, uh, 50 pitches. But uh, Boziakovic, Boziakovic, I always do that. Boziakovic looked really good and is uh, maybe still knocking on the door for another chance. Uh, remember, he got called up to the Cardinals, did not get a chance to pitch, but goes back down to Memphis, throws two innings and strikes out four 
to lower his ERA to 2.81 down there. I'd like to see him come back and get a chance to play at some point. Kind of a bummer to spend a couple of games with a big league team. You're 30 years old and you, you don't get to play. That's not very fun. Uh, Ivan Herrera, we'll update you on him. He went one for three with an RBI as he continues his rehab down in Memphis. That's going to do it, though, for this edition of the show. Appreciate you guys, as always, for listening. We'll be back Sunday night with more. We'll talk to you next time on B-Shape Daily. Peace.